contribute to the quality of life in Stockbridge. At our properties, we are proud to provide a diverse range of experience for one and all, from strenuous hikes up to Laura's Tower, to gentle ambles along the banks of the Housatonic, whether looking out at a great vista or sitting and reading a book in a sun-dappled glen, Laurel Hills properties are available to all, year-round, at no cost. It's very appropriate that we pause once a year to celebrate this all-volunteer organization that works so hard to do their best to share this 460 acres of green space with today's visitors and to preserve it for generations to come. This year we've chosen for our, as a focus for our program, a celebration of women. In the early 1800s, Mary Hopkins Goodrich, our founder, provided leadership in an era when women's contributions were over or overlooked, often overlooked. In 1853, Mary was inspired to establish the Laurel Hill Association following a horseback ride she took during a visit she made to see her family. Mounted on an imposing white horse, she rode through the Stockbridge Cemetery. Mary was shocked when she found there the cemetery was a mess. It was overgrown with brambles, weathered headstones toppled over, weeds and wild grasses clogging the open spaces. As Mary surveyed Stockbridge, her adopted home, she saw no sidewalks to keep the passers-by's feet out of the muck and mud, safe from the raw sewage running in the street, which I, which produced, and I quote, odiferous smells. Mary decided right on the spot to form an association to clean up the quaint village of Stockbridge. Her brainchild became the Laurel Hill Association, the nation's first village beautification organization. In her history of Laurel Hill, Margaret French Cresson wrote, a beginning had been made. Mary Hopkins' vitality and energy showed good signs of bearing fruit. She had a way with her and she could charm or ridicule as the case demanded. Her keen sense of humor and spicy tongue kept people amused while she shamed them out of their shiftlessness. I hope to do the same. <laughs> <laughs> They're not too shiftless, though, this group. Mary and like-minded members went to work. In early days, there was no such thing as departments of public works, so the association took on funding the construction of civic amenities like sidewalks and waterworks. In order to preserve these lands, sacred to the Native Americans who had inhabited Stockbridge, the association established the Laurel Hill Reservation, consisting of property deeded to the town of Stockbridge as a generous donation of the Sedgwick family. A central, a central feature of the new holding is this park in which we now sit. The Laurel Hill Association owns nearly 500 acres of properties in Stockbridge, open for public enjoyment. In 1834, the Sedgwick family bought the Little Hill, Laurel Hill Park, for $450 and immediately opened it to the public, which was one of the first instances of land trusts in the United States. The first national park didn't come into existence until 1872, which was Yellowstone. The National Park Service didn't come into existence until about 1903. The Sedgwicks were way ahead of their time. The association flourished, and by 1912, the New York Times headlined, Laurel Hill Association is attracting attention all over the country. The lengthy article, went on to chronicle the 1,500 village beautification organizations that had sprung up patterned after our own Laurel Hill. Now, I need to point out that for the first 20 years of Laurel Hill's history, women were not allowed to come up here on the rostrum to speak. Even our founder had to sit in the audience and say her piece. 
This changed in the third decade when Mary went front and center to address the Laurel Hill Day audience. Though women had gained influence and visibility in civic organizations, it was not till 1919 that women won the right to vote. And another celebration today is the 102nd anniversary of those brave suffragettes. It took more years of struggle before will, women of color and indigenous peoples were assured full access to this basic right to vote. Achieving this milestone required a lengthy and difficult struggle that took decades of form, reform, agitation, and protest. As we look back on our 168 year history, we see the emergence of our association as a mature community group devoted to the stewardship of land and enhancing the beauty and quality of life in the town and the surrounding Berkshires. Although our bicentennial is still 32 years in the future, we can speculate what challenges lie ahead, not only for Laurel Hill and the town of Stockbridge, <coughs> but also for our nation and our precious, increasingly fragile planet. Can the Laurel Hill Association once again serve as the national model as we deal with the inescapable impacts of climate change, extremes of temperature, more frequent and fiercer storms, accelerated change in composition of forests due to invasives and global warming? Can we hope that by 2053, that all of the glass ceilings that frustrated Mary Hopkins Goodrich and generations of women who succeeded her will at last have been broken through? Our program today speaks to all three stages of the Laurel Hill Association. The achievements of the past, our contributions today, and our dreams of the future. Laurel Hill is honored by the presence of all of you in our audience, and we invite you to join with us as we hike into that future, guided by our mission to enhance the quality of life in Stockbridge and the Berkshires. Thank you. Now, before we get started with our program and celebration of women's accomplishments, I would like to make note of the passing of one of our presidents, Homer Skip Mead. Skip led this organization from 1990 to 1992. His funeral was this morning. Skip was truly a gentleman and a scholar and his caring, thoughtful and inclusive manner was a gift to all who knew him. I'd like to ask for a moment of silence for Skip. Now, there has been a program change due to the COVID-19 pandemic that is raging across this country. President Shannon Holsley of the Mohican Stockbridge Muncie Nation felt it was not safe for her to travel from tribal lands in Wisconsin to participate in our program. But we are extremely lucky to have as President Holsey's representative, Bonnie Hartwig. Bonnie is the Tribal Historic Preservation Manager of the Stockbridge Muncie Nation. Bonnie holds a Master's of Social Science from the University of Cape Town, South Africa. And in 2013, Bonnie was awarded the American Indian Local Hero Award by the San Francisco Mayor's Office. We are honored that Bonnie will deliver the invocation, a poem written by a tribal member, and then share the remarks that President, President Holsley had hoped to give in person. So please join me in w welcoming our representative of the Mohican Nation, Stockbridge Muncie's Bonnie Hartley. The poem is called You Are One Who Walked Yesterday by our tribal member, Teresa Bolio. You are one who walked yesterday, pulled from your place in time. And now I see that your feet once stood here, imprinting the earth where I stand. In moccasins I will never see, dancing, bending in this same sun. 
to a song I will never hear. The stories you would have told were silenced by other tongues. Yet your blood is in mine, a link over time. I imagine your life from these feelings. Though I see you belonged undisturbed, covered with this dust we share, now walk with those who are gone, apachu, which means she returns. Um, Teresa wrote this poem here in Stockbridge, uh, moved by her experience here. Can you just go forward? Yes. Okay. All right. Kona Monthe, I hope you're well. It is my honor as a Mohican woman to be back on our homelands and to speak on this hill. My name in our language is Tehequin Dohat, which means she has her arms around the people. And my clan is Turtle. I'd like to acknowledge that Laurel Hill is the beloved original lands of our Mohican ancestor, Jacob Tsunik and his family, who made their home right here where we're assembled. There is a hearth right over here behind us, was tended to by Mohican women, where they drew water from the Housatonic. All of our ancestors of yesterday are still here in our people. Mohican women and our traditions are respected as the source of life, and we see our relative and our mother, the earth, who has given us all that we need for life. Our grandmother, the moon, controls the water of the oceans, including our namesake, the Mahikaniuk, or Hudson River, the water that flows both ways, as it's guided by the tides. In Grandmother Moon's relationship to all women of the world, she shares a responsibility for the birth of children. The moon constantly changes, and she brings song and poetry from our thoughts. During our tribe's history here in the Berkshires, these abundant, beautiful lands that we love, our Mohican women gathered materials and collectively created our baskets and brooms and prepared our collective feasts. They were a revered role as clan mothers. They decided who was to lead, and they themselves negotiated important agreements. Long before colonization, Mohican women were diplomats among neighboring Native nations. And since colonization, Mohican women continued this political role and engaged in treaty talks Women such as Manvet and Powask in our Mahikanatuk or Hudson Valley homelands, women who engaged in land agreements throughout the Berkshires, such as Nanasqua, and women here right in Stockbridge, such as Rhoda Kwapanwis, Roxy Seabuck, and Hannah Mudawampi. When you look at our history, you see that Mohican women have always engaged in creative adaptation to the pressures that we've faced. That is the Stockbridge Muncie experience. Under colonization and the missionary experience here in Stockbridge and our many forced removals until today, we've adapted and brought our values forward into the future. Here in Stockbridge, Stockbridge Mohican women were not allowed to sit on the English style town council established here. However, we took part in community council fires outside of the English colonial reach. We continue to be carriers of oral traditions and language, medicinal knowledge, and traditional crafts. Women's status didn't significantly change. We adopted the outward trappings of the English, but at the core community level, the roles and the values endured. After our forced removal from these lands, when Mohican people were no longer seen to have great value after serving in the Revolutionary War, Mohican women adapted and persisted and applied the lessons from the Stockbridge mission here to our new home, which became New Stockbridge, New York, among the Oneida Nation. Many Mohican men had died in service to this country in the war, and Mohican people generally became known as a nation of women by our time in New Stockbridge, and our women responded. Women such as Lydia Quinney negotiated with the Quakers in Pennsylvania to educate Mohican girls. A 16-year-old Koknaskwa, or Mary Peters, operated her first school for Stockbridge children, which included teaching knitting. It grew to two more schools taught by Koknaskwa and Margaret Matoskwa. The craft works created at these schools supplemented our community income and perpetuated traditions, since the profits were shared equally among all of our nation. By 1815, a handful of young girls that had begun in these schools grew to 60 women and girls producing hundreds of yards of flax and wool each year. 
these entrepreneuring Mohican women took the tools of the Quaker missionary education, but applied our own traditional wisdom and practices. In addition to being educators and entrepreneurs, clan mothers and community networkers, Mohican women continue to serve in our traditional role as stateswomen. Women such as Kaknaskwa of the Spinning School were also diplomats and treaty signers. Kaknaskwa held power of attorney for our tribe, traveling to Albany in 1818, where her famous uncle Apalmet was leading land negotiations. These were meant to finance our removal um, out of New York State to Indiana, where we felt we were best able to survive. Kaknaskwa spoke out against it, voicing that the women had made such progress in building New Stockbridge that it would be detrimental to have to start all over again. We eventually did remove and Mohican women such as Electa Quinney continued to adapt and lead and rebuild. Electa was trained in New York and when she came to Wisconsin in 1827, she founded the state's first public school. When women's suffrage was passed in 1920 for white women, this didn't include everyone. Uh, Native women, such as my own grandmother, Thelma Putnam, Nahananasqua, who was born in 1901, could not vote in US elections until 1924. When this finally did take place, it only reinforced at the US government level what our Native women had always traditionally done, which was be a central part of democratic decision making. My grandma went on to become civically active, as Mohican women always had, and traveled to DC with delegations to try to retain our Wisconsin lands, which we've done, and returning here to Stockbridge over the years to build bridges with local women in the churches and the libraries here. They worked to copy records and historical documents to bring back to our people. Today, women such as our president, Shannon Holsey, are empowered 21st century Mohican women who continue to adapt and to lead and keep our Mohican council fires bright. All of our tribal council officers, our president, our vice president, and our treasurer, three out of our seven member elected leadership are women again. When we look back to our first major disruption of political life here in Stockbridge in the 1700s, we can be proud that we've come a long way and that underneath the imposed viewpoints of colonization, we continue to persist as a women-led community. I think our cherished elder called Aunt Dot, or Dorothy Davids, is a respected uh, peace activist, educator, and trailblazer. She shared the Mohican women's experience well in teaching, when you go into the world, take your whole self with you. Take your roots and plant them in your new world. That is the way that Mohican women have modeled time and again. That is our superpower. Oh, nay way. <laughs>